Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, we are going to start with a reading from God's Word. This is from Exodus chapter 16, and I'm going to do a selection of the text. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Exodus 16, and we'll get into it. We'll start with chapter 16, verse 1. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And this is verse 9. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? for they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded, gather of it, each of you, as much as he can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered, some more, some less, but when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it over till the morning. Uh, this is God's word. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father, uh, I thank you that you are so faithful um, to shower your grace upon us every day. Um, and I pray that today you would do the same, uh, that you would nourish us spiritually in the ways we need uh, through your word through your Holy Spirit. Um, and so I pray, Father, you would really help us to be attentive to your word uh, in ways that would encourage and uplift us and give us perspective. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty. So uh, we are going through our series in the book of Exodus. And we're going through Exodus. Going through Exodus. Uh, we're going to look at... Last, last week, Dan talked about uh, how in the wilderness, not only do, does God test the people, but the people test God as well. And so a really interesting way of thinking about, if you read through the passage that Dan talked about last week from chapter 15, uh, a really interesting way of seeing the wilderness experience is God and Israel are feeling each other out. I'm serious. So like when you go on a date with someone, uh, you don't know a lot about each other and you're kind of like trying to understand what the other person is like. You're trying to like, you know, test them out, get to know them, see if you have things in common, all of that, right? And while God, in this passage, uh, things are not uh, well, like they're not equal. These are not equal parties with each other. So God obviously knows more about Israel but what he's doing is he's actually testing them. And then Israel, actually, Israel doesn't know much about God at all. So uh, a lot of the times when we come to these passages, we see Israel grumbling in the wilderness and we're like, they're so dumb. Like, they, they, God just rescued them from Egypt. He just parted the Red Seas. He did all these miracles for them. He just provided water. Why don't they just get it? And what's really interesting is um, they actually, th this is the difference in, uh, that happens in our lives between knowing something and knowing someone 
and then really having a battle-tested relationship with someone. So Israel is just beginning to get to know who God is and what he's like, and their relationship with him is starting to become battle-tested. Uh, in, in my marriage, so this happens like a lot of, in a lot of different ways. You could, you could illustrate this in a lot of different ways. Um, if you have like one, one example, when you're playing basketball, as one does, uh, you get together a team of people, and uh, you play together, and you're kind of like feeling each other out, like what kind of shots do you like taking? How do you play on defense? How do you communicate with one another? Uh, you're, you're feeling out each other's skill sets, um, but then when you play with someone for a long period of time, you become battle-tested, where you really understand them, and then here's the biggest thing. You trust that when things go poorly, they will not let you down. Because you all know the type of person who is not like that on the basketball court. Um, when you play with certain people, when things get really hard, they fall apart. But then there are other players that you want to be like or you, know, you, you want to have on your team where when, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going, right? Battle-tested team. And so you look at the playoffs and the NBA. I love the, I love the NBA. Um, and you have certain teams that don't mesh well together in the playoffs when things get hard. In the regular season, they're winning tons of games, everything's going really great, but when they get hit in the face by the other team in the first game, they lose their game at home, all of a sudden they fall apart because they don't know how to play together when things are hard. And in the same way, in, with Israel, when you look at them, we judge them. But what I want you to see is we actually can learn so much from the way Israel responds to the wilderness, and we are very much like Israel. We are very much like Israel when it comes to the way they respond to the wilderness. The other thing I would have you know is, just as a way of setup, um, when we're reading these passages, uh, it is a huge difference to read about what someone's going through than it is to actually experience it, okay? And so, I don't know if you realize this, when you hear your friends talk about the suffering they're going through, uh, you have this envious position of being able to listen to them without having to experience what they're actually feeling, right? But then, and so, like, I, I'm, I'm very much like this, where I can be kind of, I can be a little bit callous, I can be a little bit like, you know, whatever, what's the big deal anyway? You know, like, why don't you just, like, suck it up and be stronger or whatever, you know, when someone's sharing their problems with me. And then, do you know what happens when I go through something similar? I'm like, oh, man, my life is so hard. I can't handle it. Um, and I'm serious. I'm serious. And we're all like this, right? We, we actually all are like this. Um, uh, another th kind of thing I was thinking about as I was preparing for this passage is, um, again, when we're looking at the relationship between Israel and God, there's the sense of battle-testedness. What is the difference between a battle-tested relationship and a non-battle-tested relationship? Uh, we'll get to that later. Um, so what we're going to see in this, what we're going to see in this passage is we're going to learn about the wilderness. Uh, we're going to look at the conditions of the wilderness, and then we're going to see how God uses the wilderness. So by looking at the conditions of the wilderness, and I really want you to inhabit what it would have been like to be Israel. And so I'm going to be unpacking some of the details in the narrative, and I really want us to try as best we can to place ourselves in their shoes and think how we would react if we were in the same scenario. And here's the crazy thing. Probably most of us have never experienced anything like what they're going through. And so we have to use our imaginations, and we have to put ourselves in those circumstances. Um, so what we're going to see is uh, God leads us into the wilderness for three purposes. God leads us into the wilderness to humble us out of our self-confidence. God leads us into the wilderness to teach us to depend on his provision. And then God leads us into the wilderness so we can experience his faithfulness. So our faith becomes battle-tested with God, and our trust of him becomes battle-tested. And so this is the purpose for God allowing his people to go into the wilderness. Um, if you're a Christian... This passage should set your expectations about what your life will be like. Because when Jesus uh, first entered into his ministry, one of the very first things that happened to him was, if you look at the Gospels, what? The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness where he was tested by the devil. 
And so what's really incredible is for many of us, again, I, I keep on trying to push back against our conceptions of what Christianity is. Um, many of us conceive of Christianity as you become a Christian, and this is kind of like an intuitive sense you have. Things will go well for you, you won't experience suffering, and you won't be led into difficulty and trouble. God will make you feel great all the time, everything will be awesome. But I just want you to see, when God delivered Israel out of Egypt, he led them into the wilderness. When Jesus did his ministry, he started off by being led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, the benefit we have over Israel, and uh, Jesus knew this, but the benefit we have over Israel is we have a bird's eye perspective of this, right? Where we are not in their situation, their particular situation, and God is actually using these passages to instruct us and help us view our own wilderness experiences differently than they did. And so we have the benefit of all of scripture, um, but let me read for you one more passage from Deuteronomy. Um, and I think this is where I'm getting my points from, because this is Moses, as Israel is entering into the promised land, explaining to them the meaning or purpose behind wandering in the wilderness. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. Uh, this is what God says. You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing to know testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so we see Moses' explanation of the wilderness wanderings. And he says, you actually, you hated the wilderness, but you needed the wilderness. And in our lives, we hate the wilderness, but we need the wilderness because the wilderness first humbles us out of our self-confidence. So the first thing I want to see is I want to look at these wilderness con conditions. We're going to imagine what it was like to be in the desert. So this is from 16 uh, verses 1 through 3-ish. So they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. So Israel was delivered by the Lord out of slavery, and they started wandering. Um, they started traveling. So they started traveling on the first month, the 15th day of the first month. And so they had been wandering for, 30, for a whole month. This is the 15th day of the second month. They've been wandering for a whole month. And as we saw last time, uh, up until they, were, they were thirsty, they were dying of thirst, and then God miraculously provided for them uh, a source of water. And so they were, their thirst was slaked, and then they kept on wandering. And so they've been wandering for more days. They've been wandering for 30 days. Um, if you were in their position, how do you think you would feel? Uh, do any of you get super duper hangry? Like the, when you're really hungry, you get really angry. Like raise your hand. Any, so yeah, my, my wife gets really, really hangry. She gets really hangry. She's already an angry person, but it's, that is exacerbated by when she's hungry. So as, as husbands, it's very important to keep your wives well fed. She's, she's, she's angry with me right now. Um, but so in the wilderness, um, like, so again, they're going through a situation that we do not envy. And so we, we really have to try to like use our imagination. This is where it's like, if you think about movies where explorers are lost and they're in peril, or you just try to imagine what would it be like to travel through the desert and what was it like for them in, in the desert? In the desert, you experience all kinds of things. You experience scarcity, right? The desert, the wilderness, the phrase wilderness is basically an environment where nothing can live and thrive. And if you look at, if, if you're a biologist or whatever it might be, like you, you look at the types of animals that can survive in the desert, um, it's like lizards or like snakes or like, th there are certain animals that can survive in the desert, but it is very inhospitable to any sort of human life. And so you can't even find the lizards to eat. Like it's hard to find the lizards. It's hard to find anything to eat. Everything is scarce, water is hard to find, 
And not only this, in many desert in climates, there's such a huge fluctuation between temperatures during the day and the night. And so you, you watch movies and like, you're like freezing, you're freezing to death at night. And then in the day, you're just like, you're, you're so hot and it's so miserable. Um, the other thing about the desert is the desert is dry. Um, there's no humidity in the air. And so you start drying out. Like your body, just everything starts drying out. Um, what, what's like the thirstiest you've ever been? You know how, okay, probably the thirstiest you've ever been is like when you were in PE, like having to run a mile or like, you know, in junior high or whatever. Like wh what's the thirstiest you guys have been? Can you think of another example? What's the longest you've gone without drinking water? Or what's the situation you've been in where you've been the thirstiest? What does it feel like? Um, your tongue dries up. My tongue is a little dry right now. But that, this is a very mild case. When you get really, really thirsty, uh, you, you have that like, it's like that gritty white like powder on your tongue. You, you know what I'm talking about? Like if you've ever exercised a lot without drinking, it's like it, it just becomes this like little paste. You're, all you can produce is paste on your tongue and it's just like everywhere and you're just like, ah, ah, ah. your tongue gets swollen, your mouth dries out, it's miserable, it's terrible, right? This is the desert conditions of Israel and they were dealing with this for 30 days. And that's already a long time, but guess what? There's a lot more where that came from. Um, they were gonna wander for 40 years, and they're experiencing hunger. Now, when we're reading these passages, we, we don't see these people as real people, but they were real people. And so if you were in a situation uh, where you were starving and you were thirsty, how would you approach that issue? What would you do? You would try to find food. You would forage for food, you would look everywhere, you would send out scouting parties. They would do everything that they could to provide food for everyone. But guess what? They couldn't find any food. They were completely at the mercy of their environment, and there was nothing that they could do. All their ingenuity, all their efforts, all of their desperation, all of their intelligence, none of it could actually provide the things that they needed to get. Water, food, shelter, all of that stuff, right? And so the desert, in our lives, the desert is akin to being starving, to being thirsty. But one big thing that the desert does is it reveals our inability. It reveals our lack of control over ourselves, over life circumstances. Um, we have an illusion of control and agency and power in our lives where we think, um, and you, you, it's, it's really interesting. This is one example I've talked about before. Um, when you get people who have made a lot of money, what's really interesting is often you find that they think that they know everything about everything, not just about making money. Have you ever run into someone like this? They feel like because they have fluency in this one area, and money can do a lot of stuff, right? But they think they know everything, and they become overconfident in areas they should not be overconfident in. Money is one example. Being smart in a certain subject is another example, where um, I'm gonna make fun of my dad for a little bit, but uh, my dad is a really, really smart guy, and some of you know him. Uh, but my dad is not a doctor, yet he thinks he knows better than the doctor. <laughs> And so, you know, the doctor will tell him to do something, and then he'll, like, read WebMD and, like, the Mayo Clinic articles, and he'll diagnose himself, and then he'll go to the doctor and be like, oh, this is what I think I might have. And the, the doctor is like, well, based on, your, um, based on your long med school experience and many years of being a doctor, I concur with your conclusion. No, it's like, and then, and then not only will he do that, but it was, it's like, this is the really tricky thing. Smart people are really good at finding evidence to confirm their belief, their pre-existing belief, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? And so my dad will always, like, it's like smart people don't necessarily make the right, know the right thing or do the right thing, but they're really good at backing up what they do do using, and make it sound really convincing and smart. Um, and so, like, we are all like this when it comes to our relationship with God when it comes to our relationship with the world. And we live in Silicon Valley, which is an area in which uh, people are extremely affluent. They have a lot of agency in their lives. You feel like you can control your circumstances, 
But then a desert experience comes along and you realize that you are human and you are fragile and you are frail. Despite all of your efforts, you can't fix your marriage or you can't fix your relationships, your relationship with your parents or your relationship with your kids. You can't do it. You find that you're unable. You can't fix your job situation. You lose control and you come to the realization that this is the state of things. What other things destabilize our illusion of control? Your health. Um, uh, when, I, uh, when I was younger, I had a lot of confidence in my health. I had a lot of confidence in my physical ability. You know, like, I'm pretty strong. I could do a bunch of stuff, right? I'm really cool. Um, but then at one point, I had some kind of, like, back issue. And I remember a bunch of people were over at Jeremiah's house, and we were watching a movie. And I was on the ground, and I could, like, basically not get up off the ground because my lower back was hurting so badly. And the only difference between me being a very like active, energetic person who can lift heavy stuff and basically a child curled up into a ball on Jeremiah's floor is the stability and structural soundness of one little part of my back. Do you know what I mean? And the only difference between me being super smart and basically not being able to think at all is the integrity of my mind. And so when you run into people who have dementia or Alzheimer's, like it's really, really tragic. It's really, really sad and difficult. But it's so fragile. And then the, you think you're in control of so many different things, but do you know how, this is something you know with Toby, it's like, do you know how small the margin is between someone being alive and someone being dead? It is so fragile. Life is so fragile and difficult. And what the desert does is the desert puts you in your place, the desert humbles you, makes you realize, despite all of your best efforts, you can't do it. You can't do it. And any worldview that holds any muster must reckon with this fact. A worldview that holds muster should reckon with the fact that humans are very small in the grand scheme of things. And humans do not have the capacity to control their circumstances. Um, and so the best example, one example, uh, I'm just thinking of a bunch of examples, but um, there's a, a movie called Wandering Earth 2 that came out. And uh, my wife has read the author, the novelist's uh, three body problem novels, Chinese novels. Uh, so it's Chinese sci-fi novels that are like basically cosmic in scope. And the, the premise of Wandering Earth number one is the Earth is basically like, what, what is it? The Earth gets like knocked out of orbit and it's gonna like fall into the sun or something. I, I forgot the details, but basically the Earth, they need to find a new place for the Earth to be, and so they build 10,000 Earth engines to basically turn the Earth into a spaceship to fly away to a solar system where they can find, like in, they can re-inhabit uh, and like live, right? And so it's a really interesting premise but have you ever thought about how tenuous the state of the Earth is? When you think about these scales, at some point in the future, um, the sun will expand and swallow up the Earth. At some point, the sun will, like the, based on the life cycle of a star, the, the, this solar system will no longer be inhabitable, and the Earth will no longer, uh, we, can't live, we can't live on the Earth anymore. At some point in the future, billions of years in the future. I'm thankful it's billions of years in the future but we don't have control. And it's like, what would we have to do? What kind of human ingenuity would we have to do in order to save ourselves? And this is why Elon Musk wants to send people to Mars and inhabit Mars and eventually just like spread humanity all over the solar system, the universe, in order to preserve our tiny little group of people, right? The Earth is so small, the universe is so big, space is so deadly, and yet we are just a tiny little marble flying around at like, it's at incredible speed in this vast cosmic nothingness. This is the world we live in. This is the desert we live in. And we, it, when you think about yourself that way, it really changes. Like, you are humbled, right? You, you're humbled when you think about the scope of the universe. But you're also humbled when you run into your own inability to determine your lives. And so I think about this in a lot of different ways. Um, at, when, you're, when you're very proud, uh, like when I when I, I was I was really proud about how smart I was, and then I went to college, and they were like, I'm I'm like very average, 
like probably half of the people at my school were much smarter than me. And it's like, I'm just a person, you know? I'm humbled by that. I can't control things. I'm not that good. I'm not that good at different things. And this is the experience of being in the wilderness. So I want you to think, when you're in the wilderness, how do you respond to the feeling of being out of control, being hungry, being thirsty, being unable to dictate your circumstances? How does Israel respond? They start to grumble. And they start to look back at, uh, they start to look back at the circumstances that they had in Egypt, and they miss being slaves in Egypt. This is crazy. This is really crazy. When you think about the way Israel's perspective changes, they're really, really hungry. They haven't eaten for 30 days. And so what happens to them? Their suffering makes them irrational. Their suffering makes them forget and look back at Egypt nostalgically. When you read through the book of Exodus, let me give you a list of different things that the Egyptians did. The Egyptians slaughtered Israelite children so that they didn't become too powerful of a nation. The Egyptians forced them to do work under extremely inhumane conditions. I would even say the conditions Israel worked in are even worse than your work conditions in Silicon Valley. Yeah, I know, pretty crazy, right? Even worse than your job was the job of being a slave in Egypt. Um, but what did the, and so they weren't fed very much. They weren't fed very much. They, it's not like they were having like a seven course meal every day. Um, when you look at, when you watch natural, National Geographic, supposedly there is some kind of like really heavy nutrient rich grain beer that the slaves who built the pyramids would drink because it, both nourished them and then maybe it was like a, maybe it, it like, you know, made them feel happier so they would keep working, you know? They got drunk, I don't know. That's, I read an article about that, I don't know if it's true or not. But maybe that's what they were eating. Maybe that's what they were drinking. And so their conditions were not good, but what do they say? They're so spiritually deluded, they're so desperate that they say, I wish we were back there in Egypt. That's really crazy, and then they, uh, they imagine or they think back to their circumstances, we sat by the meat pots and we ate bread to the full. We had a great time in Egypt. Slavery was awesome. That's, that's how crazy they are, right? But, but aren't we like them? Where when you're suffering, you lose all perspective. When you suffer a very small slight, that can just blow out of proportion, where all of a sudden that is the greatest injustice that anyone in the world has ever known. You know, you know? You know what I'm talking about, right? And so suffering can really narrow our focus. It can make us self-pitying and self-centered. And it makes us irrational where we look back on pre previous circumstances as better than they were. And so this is like the grass is always greener effect, right? If I had this job, I would be happy. I get the job, I'm totally unhappy. If I had this job, it would be happy. And then you're at this new job and you're like, this manager is worse than any manager I've ever had. I really wish I could go back to that first job that you hated really badly and wanted to get out of. Am I wrong? Like, have you gone through something like this? This is what we're like. And so the wilderness humbles us out of our self-confidence. But the crazy thing is God does this for a purpose. In Deuteronomy, it says God did it. God led them in the wilderness. And that both means God led them into the wilderness, but God led them through the wilderness, right? Where God intended them to go into that arid desert, into those inhospitable circumstances. Why would God possibly do that? And this is where we get something really crazy from the miracle, from the manna and the quail. Um, God did that so that they would be able to understand what God is like, so they would feel God out and be able to be assured, increasingly assured, that God is trustworthy and he's a good God who takes care of them. And so, as we get humbled out of our self-confidence, as we come to the end of ourselves, there is a possibility that God can use that wilderness to teach us what it looks like to depend on him, right? To teach us what it looks like to depend on God. What does it look like for them to depend on his provision? Um, what's really interesting here, they, they're complaining about, eat, uh, about the desert. They say, we had these meat pots. I don't know what, like, well, I don't know what a meat pot is, but they had, we had meat pots and we ate all of the bread we could have wanted, and now we're in the desert and we have nothing. And so what happens next? They complain to Moses, 
And then Moses says, God hears your grumbling, and then God responds to their grumbling. And the, the Israelites, like, the further you get on in the Exodus account, the more their attitude towards God uh, becomes incredibly uh, ridiculous. It's, it's, almost, it, it's almost funny if it wasn't sad, because over and over again, God provides for them. Over and over again, God is patient for them. But over and over again, they forget, they do bad stuff, they want to worship other gods, and we're the same way. We really are the same way. Um, but we have a different perspective where we can actually learn from their experiences in a way that instructs us and leads us not to do it. So as God leads us into the wilderness, he humbles us out of our self-confidence. If you're going through a wilderness experience right now, um, I just want you to know God is trying to teach you something, and it definitely involves humbling. It definitely involves humbling in some way. Um, it, in order for you to experience depending on God and his provision, you have to be humble. And that means, number one, when Jesus says the Lord's Prayer, Jesus, in one, one of the phrases in the Lord's Prayer is, give us this day our daily bread. And he is basically saying, this passage is saying, uh, the Deuteronomy passage is saying, apart from God sustaining you, all of us would fall apart in an instant. In Colossians, it basically says that, you know, in, in the book of Acts, uh, Paul says, in God, we live and move and have our being. In Colossians, it says that Jesus Christ is the one who holds all things together. And so if you think that you can hold yourself together in any way, physically, emotionally, spiritually, without God, go to the wilderness and learn the lesson that you can't. When you go through extremely bad depression, you are powerless and you really feel it, or a really bad addiction. You're just like, I can't do anything. I thought I could control myself. I just can't. I can't help myself from ruining my life. This is how, this is how difficult it is. This is how difficult the wilderness is. But why is God leading us into wilderness? To make us let go of our self-confidence and cry out to him, and then look how God provides. What does he do? Every day, he's, uh, every day there are two different meals. There's the quail, and this is really cool, because when the people of Israel grumbled against God, God could have said, you, you like ungrateful people, I just led you out of Israel, why are you complaining? But he actually doesn't do that because again, they're testing each other out, they're feeling out the relationship, and so God is so incredibly patient with them, and he answers their prayers very particularly and sp specifically. They're grumbling, they're complaining, but what do they want? They want meat pots and they want bread. So what does God give them? He gives them quail, and he gives them manna. And manna means, what is it? Like, they don't know what it is. And so they're a really interesting kind of, um, they're, uh, anyway, okay, I won't get inside. Um, so he specifically answers their question, their prayers in a very gracious way, where he gives them what they're asking for. And so when you think about this from God's perspective, what is he trying to do to provide, by providing for them? He is showing them every single day, Every single day in the desert, they can't find food on their own. But every single day, God provides for them quail and God provides for them manna. And so day after day after day, they would have gathered the food that they would have needed and they would have distributed it among their family and that's the only thing that was keeping them alive. That's how serious it was. The only thing keeping them alive was this provision from God. The only thing keeping them alive in the desert was this provision from God. What lesson is this teaching them? And this is really what you need when you go through the wilderness, what I need when we go through the wilderness. What we need is a consistent, like we need to understand the character of God and experience it over and over and over until God breaks through our spiritual blindness and we begin to deeply trust him. So let me use an example from um, our marriage. So we haven't been married that long, but there is something that happened whenever we would get in fights like throughout our, throughout our marriage up to this point. Um, so uh, there, there's like a pattern that would happen in our fights where I would be like, I would basically be not doing very much or not contributing, and then Ashley would call me out about it, which she rightly would, 
And then she basically said, like, you're not helping me with this task. I would like you to help me with this task. And then I would say, like, basically, are you saying I don't do anything? Are you saying I'm useless as a man? Like, I'm serious. The way I would interpret what she said was that I would feel insecure about myself, and I would think she's saying something different, where she's actually trying to attack or criticize me personally and say I am less of a man or something like that. But then what's really interesting is when we'd work through those fights over and over again, she would, I would share how I was feeling, and she would say, that's not what I mean. That's not, how, that's not what I'm intending to say to you. And I still felt like that. But over time, as we had that fight over and over again, I started to believe her, you know? I started to trust that what she was saying was actually not for my ill. She wasn't trying to like tear me down. She actually wanted to like address an issue that we had together as a couple. And then at some point, I feel like I could trust her more and I could actually believe that. And so in that moment, sometimes I still feel like insecure. But then I remember, based on past experience, based on the pattern of her interactions, she doesn't mean that. Now, probably there are examples where she does mean that, but like, that's where it gets tricky. But, <laughs> but it, like, at, the, at our deepest heart of hearts as a married couple, like, we love each other. And that's what I can kind of rely on to help me interpret her in the way that she should be interpreted. In the same way with God, what we need is a long history of God providing manna in the wilderness and to experience it in a way that helps us to trust him. And now, so this wilderness experience, if you depend on God's provision, will grow your faith in him. Do you see, do you see what, can you imagine what it would have been like? Seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, for 40 years, every single day, they were absolutely dependent on God and he never once let them down. He never did not provide the food that they needed to survive. Do you know what that would do for your trust of God? Now the crazy thing is, it didn't do much because they still didn't trust God. And that's actually really bleak for us because we cannot follow their, like we can't even do it. But then again, like I alluded to before, um, when Jesus came to this world, uh, when Jesus was led by the Spirit out into the wilderness, Jesus perfectly depended on God for provision, and he modeled what we should do, but also he lived that perfect life that we couldn't so that we could be saved. So the grace of God acts before we do anything to deserve it, but then the wilderness experience is giving us perspective where we can say in the middle of the wilderness, when I am humble, I say, look, God, I don't know what I need. I, if you are sending me into the wilderness, there must be a good reason that you're doing it because I have experienced past wildernesses and I've learned how they humble me, how they make me closer to you, how they help me trust you more. And so this is God teaching us to depend on the wilderness. We don't want the wilderness, but we need the wilderness. So let me, let me use an example. Um, when I was in college, uh, I was going through a really, really difficult time in my faith. I, I shared this before. I made an ultimatum with God. I'm like, I don't believe in you. God, you have two months to like convince me that you're real and that you're good, or else I'm going to not be a Christian anymore. The circumstances I was going through, again, I would not recommend people to test God like that, but he came through. Um, the circumstances I were going through was I was um, having, like, a, I had a fractured friendship with a really close friend that made it really, really difficult for me. I felt really, really miserable, and there was nothing I could do to like reconcile that relationship. Um, and in that moment, I hated it. In that moment, I was angry with God. I was furious with him. There, there was a point where I was running. I was doing some running, and I was running back to my dorms, running by cars, and I really wanted to punch in a glass window of some random car on the side of the street. I'm not an angry person, I don't think. I'm not, I'm not violent, but I really wanted to do it, and I didn't do it because it would hurt my hand and I would have to pay for it. But th that's how I felt, that's how I felt towards God. And the incredible thing is, that was me in the wilderness. But then now that I'm out of the wilderness, do you know what happened during those two months? Number one, God deepened me intellectually, where I read C.S. Lewis over again, I read the Gospels over and over again, I listened to sermons, 
And my faith was more confirmed intellectually as a result of my doubt and my struggling. I felt more assured in God than I did as, uh, as before as a result of this doubt, as a result of this wilderness where things are scarce. I don't, I was, feelings were scarce. My feelings towards God were totally gone. I'm like, where are you, God? What are you doing? But then now I have the perspective where the whole time when I look back on that, the way I felt was totally out of touch with what God was doing because God was humbling me. God was humbling me. God was providing for me. There were people, and so it's like, in the moment, I'm like, God, you're not helping me at all. When I look back on it, I had really great friends that were talking to me. My campus minister was praying for me and caring for me. Like, all kinds of people were caring for me. God was or putting, like, putting in my hands. This is one of the coolest things that God does for me. I love reading. And when I go through hard times, every once in a while, God will, in his providence, stick in my hand, I mean, sometimes I buy it on Amazon, but I see that also as God's providence. He will stick in my hand the exact book with the exact passage that I need to communicate to my heart how much he loves me or some truth that encourages me, some, some thing that gets me through. And that is the particularity of God's provision, where you see in the desert, in the wilderness, they gather the manna. Some people gather a lot, some people gather a little, but every single person has exactly what they need. You, did you catch that detail? So that means basically there are some really big, strong guys like Lawrence. Lawrence can pick up so much manna. He could just like pick up sackfuls of manna and just throw it on his back and he's like, you know? But then there's like someone like, I don't know who's a small person, Callie. And Callie can't carry them. You're, you're small now, but you're young. So maybe one day you'll grow to be as big as Uncle Lawrence. Um, he, she can't carry very much, but God knows exactly what she needs, and so God gives them exactly what they need to eat. It's particular. That is how patient God is with them. Even when they're grumbling, he cares for each individual in a very specific way. And so in the wilderness, he will care for you in that way as you go to him, as you turn to him. So what does this look like? It means gathering the manna. Like, I, I want you to notice this. This is what uh, Tim Keller said. Um, God very easily could have zapped the manna into their stomachs. It's, it's pretty funny, right? Where it's like, why didn't God just be like, zap, you're full. You wake up in the morning, oh man, I'm hungry. I'm going to drink some coffee. And then zap, oh, my stomach's full. Ashley would love that. Um, but that's not what he did. He gave them the way which they gather the manna. And this is, uh, now, like, I want to be careful about how we apply this. Um, what I think this means is there is both a passive and an active component to our relationship with God. If you're in the wilderness, you have to take action and you have to do something to gather the provision of God. And so the, the other thing is, I would say, so this is not like you have to be perfect in your quiet times and you have to attend church every week and you have to do all the things right. Because I know what it's like when all of those things are nearly impossible. And God is so incredibly gentle and gracious with us when we're struggling that he will, he will basically take any small effort in his direction and he will respond to that incredibly powerfully with graciousness. And so he doesn't expect you to do more than you can do. But there has to be some way that you go and gather the provision of God. And so what does this look like? Uh, this looks like the ah prayers. Oh yeah, that got your attention, didn't it? Ah, no. The ah prayers, where you don't even have words to pray for what you need. You are so desperate and you are like, you're unintelligible because you are so um, overwhelmed by grief or difficulty. And God responds to that so powerfully. He loves that type of authentic prayer in the wilderness. He loves that far more than our like polished, like, christian -y prayers that we do when, the, when Daniel asks you to pray at the end of Bible study. Way, he loves that way more. He will respond to any effort you make towards him. But for some of you in the wilderness, if you are not making any effort and then you're complaining that God isn't providing for you, God has left the manna there for you, you're just not gathering it. You're not bringing your hand to your mouth to let God nourish you. And so I just want to encourage you with that. God is so faithful to provide, and the regular means that God uses to give grace to you are the ways that he will use to get you through the wilderness, which means basically to pray to him, 
to say to God, give me today my daily bread. And then scripture, where, uh, you know, there are passages all throughout scripture. In Deuteronomy, it says, um, we do not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so God is saying, look, if you want to have perspective in the wilderness, if you want to have encouragement and comfort and strength to get through what you're going through, turn to scripture, turn to prayer, turn to God so that you can be nourished by him. But here's the crazy thing. I think ultimately um, the way that God provides manna in the wilderness is in the person of Jesus Christ. In the, in the Gospel of John, uh, when in chapter one of uh, the Gospel of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, describing Jesus Christ. In John chapter six, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. What John, the author, is saying is Jesus is the Word who is bread of life for the people who turn to him and believe in him. And just as in Deuteronomy it says, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, Jesus Christ is the bread in the wilderness. This is a foreshadowing of Jesus coming to the world as bread, as the mission of God, the word of God spoken by him to meet us in the wilderness and to provide for us and to satiate us. If you're empty, if you feel like you got nothing, Turn to Jesus, the true bread of life. He will provide for you. He will meet you where you are in your wilderness, and that will give you strength to endure. And then the other thing is, the beauty of the Christian life is you might know that God loves you, but it is only in the wilderness that it becomes experiential, where you can taste and see the goodness of God. And there are some precious moments where you are at your most lost and most desperate, most downcast, where God meets you of his own accord, purely out of his grace, and he encourages and comforts you exactly in the way you need. Your circumstances haven't changed. I have experienced this a few times. Your circumstances are still as they are. You still have the troubles and problems that you are going through. God doesn't promise that he will necessarily remove those in this moment, but what he does do is gives you a sense of assurance and his love and perspective and that strengthens you. It's manna in the wilderness for you to get through. Will you turn to him? Will you gather through scripture, through prayer? You're already gathering by showing up here, but continue to gather, continue to trust him, and then you will be, you will be blown away by as time passes, your, your relationship with God becomes battle-tested. And the next time when you go through the wilderness, You'll, you'll have a map. You won't, you won't fall apart in the same way that you did the first time. Why? Because God is so trustworthy. You know that you, things are so uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen, but God is so trustworthy and good. Uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, um, I thank you that you are so faithful to us. Um, I thank you that you are so gentle and gracious And even when we grumble against you, you still love us, you don't give up on us, uh, you reach out to us. And what we need, Lord, more than anything, is to hear from you, to hear your perspective, and then I pray, Lord, by your grace, you would create in us the desire to respond with obedience, uh, to respond with uh, trust and acceptance of our circumstances. Um, And I pray, Lord, you would give us a vision for even how the worst things that we go through, the deepest, darkest wildernesses um, where all normal provision runs dry would be a place where we would meet you and you would meet us and provide for us and give us incredible testimony of your provision. Um, We pray you would do this in each one of our lives. I pray you would particularly apply um, and provide for uh, my brothers and sisters uh, this week, today, um, as we go from here. We really love you and pray this in Jesus' name, amen.